Okay, well, uh, welcome to everyone first. Um, so I'm going to give you a talk on the use of uh, HSAF satellite data in the European Flood Awareness System, which is, uh, is a system that um, um, by providing hydrological uh, ensemble predictions is obviously also part of the HEPEX um, group. Now I'm going to give you, um, let's say, the perspective of, of, uh, of someone that is uh, developing an operational flood forecasting system and has a very uh, pragmatic, um, let's say, end user driven uh, point of view uh, when it comes to integration of uh, products in an operational flood forecasting system. Now, um, as uh, uh, here are uh, people from the HSEF uh, community, uh, my presentation will first start with a brief uh, explanation on, on EFAS, as probably EFAS is not familiar to all of you. And then I'll show some examples of, of, of uh, how we use HSAF or uh, other satellite data in, in EFAS. Uh, I'll show a few case studies that we did on uh, uh, data simulation with uh, satellite data. And then as I have the chance to provide feedback to the HSAF community, I would like to make also maybe some suggestions for, for further products that we would uh, think that are developed uh, interesting for us. Uh, and could be developed by the HSAF uh, community. Now, the European Flood Awareness System is a, a pan-European um, flood forecasting system, which is fully operational since September 2012 under the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. And uh, EFAS, the structure of EFAS consists of four uh, centers. We have the EFAS Computational Center. This is where the forecasts are uh, run. Um, this is hosted here at ECMWF. We have the EFAS Dissemination Center. The EFAS Dissemination Center has the task to daily analyze forecasts, send out flood alerts, uh, produce, um, organize the annual meetings or trainings, etc. And this is done by a, by a consortium of the Swedish, Dutch, and uh, Slovak Hydrometeorological Institutes. Then we have, obviously, the Hydrological Data Collection Center that contains uh, historic as well as near real-time uh, hydrological data um, collection for the use of EFAS. And uh, this is done by the Spanish uh, Environment and the Lusian Environmental Agency in, cons in collaboration with uh, this private enterprise, Elimco. And last but not least, obviously, we also need meteorological data collection. Uh, again, this is also historic as well as near real-time data collection um, that is currently still done uh, at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, but uh, will soon also be outsourced. Now, what are the main objectives of, of, of EFAS of such a pan-European flood forecasting system? There's basically two. Um, one is to provide uh, added value, complementary flood forecasting information to the national services. How do we do that? For example, we focus on hydrologic ensemble predictions. We look at medium range forecasts. We pro provide basin wide forecasts in contrast to many uh, national or regional services. So uh, we also try to be a platform for, for knowledge, knowledge exchange and operational flood forecasting. Um, so, um, our, our, let's say our added value is, is, is manifold in that sense. And the second bigger objective of EFAS is, of course, uh, to provide a European scale overview uh, of potential upcoming floods to the Emergency Response uh, Coordination Center, which is, uh, let's say, the responsible part in the European Commission when it comes to large international or European disasters, in our case, flood disasters. It's their task to coordinate the international uh, help, uh, and they make use uh, of ethos in order to better be prepared in case such event happens. Um, now, the development of ethos is already EFAS is, is already more than uh, 10 years old, and obviously, uh, the development has taken part with with the collaboration of, of, of partner institutions. So we have ethos partners which are mostly uh, the national or regional hydrometeorological authorities who have the responsibilities in their region or in their country for flood forecasting. And currently, 
We have more than uh, 35 partners. Uh, it's not only EU members, but uh, also non-EU. So the only basically limiting uh, factor for, for, for an EFAS partner is, is, let's say, the model domain. Um, now, um, let's look a little bit at the technical setup, because that will become more important when I, when I show you some examples of how we use satellite data. Um, what we do is we run a distributed hydrological model, which is called uh, LISLUD, uh, which was developed um, um, at the JRC uh, quite a long time ago, actually. Um, the spatial extent is Europe. Uh, you see it here, the red uh, rectangle here uh, outlines the current spatial extent. Um, we have a grid resolution of 5 by 5 kilometers. The temporal resolution of the forecast that we calculate is uh, six hourly with the exception of the ECMWF EPS, which currently still runs daily, but uh, is, is, uh, is already uh, foreseen to run also uh, six hourly. It's just not yet in the operational uh, production. Then uh, the, the temporary resolution of the initial condition, so uh, the water balance of the model that is then used as a start for the flood forecast is, is daily. And as I said, we use um, various meteorological forecasts because we try to emphasize hydrological ensemble predictions, the benefits of hydrological ensemble predictions. So we have forecasts from the German Weather Service as well as ECMWF and the Cosmo Consortium. Um, we update our forecast twice a day at 12 and 0 UTC. Uh, at each of these times, it's, let's say, 69 ensemble members that consist actually of these different uh, weather services. And uh, so, so we have a total of 138 forecasts are produced every day. Um, well, the hydrological model, uh, obviously, we do uh, some calibration on it. Um, this calibration exercise is, is updated every one and a half uh, to two years in order to integrate more stations and more information uh, uh, improvements in the, in the hydrological model setup. Uh, currently, the current operational version has close to 700 uh, uh, subcatchments calibrated. The distribution you see here. Um, we obviously uh, need also then, as I said, we need near real-time meteorological observations that go into the system. And currently we have, uh, and this is shown here on the picture on the left, um, on the left-hand side, we have more than 8,000 uh, near real-time meteorological observations that go, um, that are processed and, and then are used for, for calculation of the initial conditions every day. Uh, the weather forecast um, that we are using, as I said, is, uh, we use two deterministic ones, the German Weather Service forecast, which has a lead time of seven days, and then the ECMWF deterministic forecast, which we currently use only at 10 days. Uh, we are testing, it's also in, in, in testing mode uh, to use the 15 days, but um, this requires also adaptation when, when it comes to visualization of these uh, products. So. Um, this is something, this is ongoing work. So at the moment we use the, uh, only the first uh, 10 lead times. Then we use ensembles, uh, the ECMWF EPS ensemble, which consists uh, out of 51 ensemble members, 10-day uh, lead time. And we use a high-resolution um, uh, ensemble member forecast, which is the Cosmo Labs. as a five-day lead time, 16 ensemble members, and you see that the grid resolution is approximately seven by seven kilometers. is is quite quite a high resolution for uh, ensemble forecast. Um, now, as being a uh, European system, you can imagine we have forecasters sitting in uh, in Sweden and a forecaster sitting in Spain and a forecaster sitting in Romania. So, uh, for us, visualization and communication of all this information is crucial. Um, we have developed a web interface uh, where you can um, activate many layers. You, just, you can zoom in, you can click on points and get these kind of persistence graphs that are shown here. So we try to make it as user-friendly and as adapt adaptable to, to the different preferences of, of the personal forecaster as, um, as possible. Now, let's come to the, to the satellite data. One, well, when we started um, looking at, at how to integrate satellite data, um, which was actually not, to be honest, not, not very long ago, um, we said, well, there's, there's, for us, there's 
for us as an operational flood forecasting system, there's two conditions that uh, need to be met. First of all, the products need to be available in a, in a fully operational mode, which excludes a lot of satellite data already. And secondly, obviously, they need to present an added value to the information that we have already in, in, uh, in EFAS. Now, one obvious added value information is that we try to use satellite data for visual comparison and validation of, of model initial conditions that we have uh, in EFAS. Um, so one of these products would then uh, was obviously the soil moisture product uh, that is coming from from the HSAF uh, data. Um, here, um, I should say we well in order to make it comparable, um, the soil is differently parameterized in in Listler than it is obviously in in the HSAF product. So we had to tweak um, a little bit. Um, the outcome of the HSAF products in order to make it comparable um, to, to the Lisler data. Um, uh, in fact, what you see here is the uh, so relative soil moisture of the top layer in, in Lisflood. Uh, in Lisflood, we only have two soil layers, which are actually variable in, in, in depth over, over the spatial domain. And uh, uh, for the HSAF data, we took actually only the three uppermost layers uh, with a weighted average in order to kind of roughly approximate um, um, uh, to the data that comes out of the out of list that model. Um, so here is a, is a screenshot of, uh, of uh, this is available to the forecaster every day in uh, in the EFAS interface. Um, this is from the, um, the model initial conditions from the 31st of October 2014 in comparison to, um, to the uh, soil, relative soil moisture coming from the HSAF um, um, product. And uh, while we hope that this gives the forecaster an additional tool in order to build up, let's say, trust in, uh, in, in the forecast for his specific regions. And you can see, obviously, while well, there's regions where there's a good coincidence, but there's also regions where, uh, where there's some, uh, some differences. Um, a similar, we did a similar thing for um, comparing uh, satellite snow water equivalent in near real time with, with the output of, with the snow water equivalent uh, coming out of uh, Listblad. Um, again, this is a, a, a basically a screenshot out of uh, the EFAS webpage um, for um, the simulated snow water equivalent from Lisbeth on the 31st of October, and uh, in comparison, the HSAF uh, snow water equivalent product for the same for the same date. Um, as we heard already yesterday, actually, this is uh, I took this information when with, with regards to the accuracy from the HSAF website, but uh, I learned today that uh, that uh, the accuracy is uh, is actually uh, more close to 40 to 50 millimeters for for HSAP. Obviously, in the in the onset of the snow season, which is the 31st of October, uh, where snow depths are relatively small, um, um, an accuracy of around 40 to 50 millimeters is obviously problematic. Um, which you can see there in Poland and. and um, further to the east, where uh, the satellite product shows um, 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 very low amounts of snow. A second problem for us um, uh, when it comes to snow water equivalent, well, for us um, in, in, in flood forecasting, um, well, snow melt induced floods are often produced in very mountainous terrain. Uh, and I understand that uh, the satellite data um, has problems when, when retrieving uh, this type of information very, in very pronounced topo topography. Uh, so that is obviously for, represents for us things that, that are problematic. Nevertheless, we still believe that, uh, that at least the visualization of, of the HSAF snow water equivalent is, provides an added value uh, to our forecasters. Now, um, in flood forecasting, we are, we are looking at extremes, and we have gotten often from our end users a request uh, saying, well, you know, it's fine to show me snow water equivalent, but I can't actually use anything about this. It's, I need to know 
how 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 abnormal or anomalous uh, the amount of snow is in relation to uh, what we have observed or what what, what was there the last 20 years. Um, so we looked at uh, uh, so we we produced anomaly products from uh, from our model, uh, and this is what you can see here on the left hand side. This is. Um, uh, 10 day average uh, snow water equivalent anomaly map for the uh, 28th of April 2014 coming out of uh, Liz flood. And in this case, for the snow water equivalent, we were lucky because uh, there is a product available from the Finnish Meteorological Institute, um, which is the uh, standardized snowpack indicator, which is shown here um, on, uh, next to, next to uh, the Liz flood output. Um, so the user can use both images again for a, a better judgment of, of how anomalous the, the possible situation with respect to, 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 snow, um, to snow is. Here the, the red colors indicate that or the orange, yellow to red colors indicate that it's highly less than normal and, uh, and uh, purple to blue colors indicate a, uh, highly more uh, snow than normal. Um, now we've seen also yesterday's presentation, for example, in the in the June May June 2013 floods in the Danube in uh, and Elbe, uh, very extremely saturated soil moisture conditions were one of the mo one of the mo important precursors for for such a severe event. Uh, now, unfortunately, our uh, soil moisture anomaly product was not yet ready at that time, but this was one of the reasons why we said, okay, we also need to produce a, uh, a similar anomaly product for, uh, for the soil moisture. Uh, unfortunately, to at least to our knowledge, uh, or to my knowledge, I don't, I'm not aware if there's a, a similar soil moisture anomaly product available for, from satellite data, but this is something which would uh, for a flood forecast to be of extreme uh, value also for, for us, of extreme important to have such a, such a product. And, I, and I, I'm not a satellite expert, but I, I think there, there is now uh, quite a long time series of satellite measurements should be available in order to derive maybe such a, such a product. Um, now, we've looked also at... Uh, uh, assimilating satellite data into the, into EFAS. Uh, we did uh, a study um, looking at the assimilation of snow cover data. Um, there we used uh, the MODIS combined uh, snow cover data product uh, and as, uh, we used the particle filter as an assimilation method. Uh, obviously, as I've shown before, Lishla doesn't ingest snow cover but it needs snow water equivalent, so we used uh, snow depletion curves in order to, to get to the snow water equivalent and we tested this on, a, on the Morara River Basin. Uh, now just briefly for what our findings were for this offline case study, well we found obviously that the improvements, there's improvements for simulated snow cover in all, in, in all of the different scenarios that we have, uh, that we have analyzed in that paper um, and However, only in the smaller upstream areas we could observe, we could observe improvements in discharge. Uh, larger basins showed, however, only limited improvements uh, with respect to discharge simulation, which is, of course, for a flood forecast of the important variable to, uh, to look at. We did not look, I have to say, we did not actually do a hindcast um, simulation at, uh, for this table, so uh, we did not look at, at whether the, the, the forecast skill actually would be uh, improved or, or decreased. If you want to look up uh, some more details on, uh, on this study, there's a, a paper in remote sensing that was published last year. Then we looked, oh, well, this was done actually by a PhD student, Nico Wanders at the University of Utrecht. He looked at uh, assimilating um, satellite soil moisture in combination with discharge data into list flood into the operational setup of, of, of LISLAT in, in EFAS. For this study, he used a uh, combination of ESMOS, ASCAT, and AMSURE soil moisture data and in combination with seven discharge data, uh, seven discharge stations. Uh, we used uh, Ensemble Kalman filter as an assimilation method. And as I said before, um, uh, in this case, we actually had to modify 
the soil parameterization in LISDOT in order to be able to, to assimilate uh, the satellite soil moisture data in a proper way uh, into the model. We did this study on a quite a large catchment because, uh, as I said, for us, um, being a pan-European continental scale system, uh, it is very important to look at, to look at the effects of, of very large scale uh, catchments. So here we use the upper Danube. And uh, there we also did a hind casting, one year hind casting experiment from uh, 2010 to 2011. Now, um, the results briefly basically is that, well, we saw that for this case, soil moisture assimilation alone did not always improve discharge simulations. However, the combination of soil moisture and discharge, uh, near real time discharge assimilation improved. Uh, uh, quite a bit the forecasting skill. Now, if you, um, uh, I can't go into detail about this, this case study, but if you want to read up on it, this is published in uh, this year's uh, HES paper in 2014. Now, uh, coming to an end, well, um, for us, the satellite products, I think we, for, we believe that the satellite products provide valuable complementary information uh, in near real time for, for our pan-European flood forecasting system EFAS. Um, the, um, the satellite images are only available basically with operationally in, in our system since, since May 2014, but uh, we are looking forward to more feedback also from, uh, on these products from our users. Um, as I said, for us, our uh, anomaly products being uh, looking at, at, at extreme events, anomaly products are, are really highly valuable. So it would be great that uh, if the HSF community could uh, maybe look into po to the possibility of producing more of these anomaly products. Then I have not said anything about the uh, HSF precipitation products. Um, this is basically out of one reason. Uh, and that comes back to the, my, the beginning of my presentation. Um, the product that we would use potentially is the accumulated precipitation. However, that is not yet operationally from my understanding. So this is why we haven't actually looked into the use of HSF uh, accumulated precipitation products. With respect to data assimilation, uh, it seems that the combination of soil moisture with, with discharge data assimilation is most promising. I have to say, however, there's big challenges uh, lying ahead. I mean, most of you will probably know going from a little research study to a fully operational setup is, is, is still a long way to go. Uh, the two major challenges that we still have, we still have to test this assimilation at a continental scale, because this is what uh, EFAS is doing. Um, and uh, we also need to look at a feasibility study on, on and, and looking more at the operational aspects of data assimilation. So uh, with the computer power I have currently, can I uh, have an ensemble Kalman filter with uh, 300 ensemble realizations, et cetera? Maybe should I use a different ensemble method? Um, what happens if maybe there's a data transmission of transmission failures or if satellite data not arrives? How may, do I make sure that the performance of the model doesn't decrease significantly, et cetera, et cetera? These are all questions that we need to, that we still need to look at before um, um, putting data assimilation into the operational ethos. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks for your attention. It in uh, the question was on um, on the inclusion of of urban floodings. Well, if you um, mean um, heavy precipitation events with related to flash floods, we have a uh, product um, which is a flash flood indicator. Um, but I mean, there's clear limitations also to, uh, to to the prediction of flash floods. But we are we have some products to that. But EPAS is primarily designed being a pan-European continental system for large-scale flooding. But we do have some, some flash flood indicators as well. Some, some like the water, 
hydraulic structures that can be effective in flooding case not considered in the land cover information. I did not understand that question. So. I mean, if you are just having a bridge, yes. you may have the flood and the bridge widens the passage and it is created flooding. You mean that whether we have, uh, well, <coughs> what we base our forecast on is um, is on the exceedance of return periods. We do not look at a very local structure such as bridges or blockages. Uh, we also cannot include, or we also do not include ice jams, for example. All these very small scale features are, are something that that should be that need to be resolved by a high resolution system. I mean, the aim of EFAS is, as I said, to focus on on also on medium range forecasting, which is in many national services is they focus more on the short term high resolution uh, forecast, so two to three days, um, and then they use EFAS as kind of a pre-alerting system in order to make sure that they have then the attention to look on their system and to get the details out of the potential flooding. Okay. Could you explain a bit about the uh, added value of EFOS uh, uh, in relation to the national football costing? Yes. It varies from country to country, I have to say. I mean, it's... Uh, Let's say, let's take extremes. The Dutch, ah yeah, sorry. So the question was about the added value of EFAS for the national services. Um, let's say, take the example of the Dutch system, which has a long tradition of, 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 of floods uh, and has a very sophisticated uh, uh, system with respect to flood forecasting and flood warning. They use uh, EFAS uh, more under the aspect of, of, of exchange of knowledge uh, with other uh, partners that they usually wouldn't be in contact ever with. I mean, we have usually public agencies that do not have such an exchange as is normal under the research community in, in universities. Uh, so they use this EFAS more as a platform for knowledge exchange. Then we have other countries who have no forecasting system at all. Um, they rely just on observations. Uh, for them, they use uh, EFAS as the only system they have. Uh, and then we have many countries or many regions that are somewhere in between. So it varies really throughout Europe, um, the use of, of EFAS. So you, you are now using forecast of the 10 days, and you yes. mentioned that we've got a workshop or a discussion to look into the season of that state. In between that, there is the monthly test day with two, three, four, where we now we are now able to predict, especially some extreme events driven by last days in Humphrey. So, are you planning to look more at that time range, two, three weeks before? Yes. So the question was about um, whether we will ingest uh, seasonal to monthly forecasts into into EFAS. Uh, in fact, we we are uh, we are running already seasonal forecasts uh, and uh, in 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 the computational systems, uh, and we will be uh, as well for the monthly. But there, the question is is not so much about the actual running, but it's about how how to communicate and how to visualize the information because it does not make sense to have a normal hydrograph for the next uh, month. Uh, but uh, it is not clear, we, well, it's still a topic also under research and under discussion to see how you can actually make the best use of this data. So maybe an idea is to kind of give an, an outlook based on a, on, a, on a river basin scale with a threat to potential flooding in that river basin. Those are things that, uh, that we are still looking at. Um, but it is foreseen also to, to include uh, this type of information, yes. Well, a question from the web, from Jan Bernerska. He's asking about uh, uh, what's the added value of pre alerting for national services in comparison with using the precipitation forecast. Uh, is it heavy, is enough to have a heavy precipitation forecast or um, do a very well plus? 
Do I have to repeat the question because it come oh, okay the, so the question was uh, on the added value of the pre alerting in comparison to uh, a normal ECMWF uh, uh, heavy precipitation forecast um, well I mean I think it's not enough if you want to have uh, uh, um, at least a pre-alert information for, for a flood forecast uh, by just looking at the precipitation forecast because uh, it depends very much on the other variables in your system like we've seen the soil moisture, maybe how much snow is uh, there uh, and, and, and other variables that contribute to a potential flood so it's not only the, uh, the precipitation um, so I think um, and, and I think this is uh, where, where the added value of EFAS comes in. This is a European Commission project, which is now under the level of cooperative energy management. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in the mission, there is a to give a complementary information information of the table. Complementary information. And as it is a system, so the European not our system, so you have a model, that is the plus one, which is your access. And as far as this end, it is an hydrogen model, which runs all, all over Europe. This means that it collects as all the hydrogen models, the, the full description in, of the basis. One of the output is either or not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know that this information about the basic is uh, it's a very costly information because it's a very high resolution. And uh, in each country there are agencies which are in charge to this. So you have a, a tight connection for updating your and the official bilateral agreements with the national agency in such a way that the quality of your payday flood, uh, I mean, delivery can be considered uh, according to a quality management system, like a hydro standard or something like that. Okay, the, the question you know, was... One of the main elements for a provision of information from a system is that the system is in a, in, 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 uh, uh, managed in a process which can accomplish some standards. Okay. In hydrology, we more or less apply the FMO standards. In hydrology, there are several standards, but generally speaking, for the integrity problems, there are the type of standards. Um, okay, so the question was about um, how um, we, in, in essence, um, how we connect uh, or how is the, the connection between EFAS and the national uh, partners and uh, how do we make sure that uh, uh, EFAS output or the EFAS uh, simulations um, fulfill some kind of uh, standard um, um, with respect to flood forecasting. Now, um, we have to separate that a little bit. Um, we have agreements uh, with each of the uh, national or regional uh, authorities um, that use um, EFAS, okay? So there's, uh, there is a constant uh, exchange um, of, of, of knowledge and, and feedback from those partners on the quality uh, of those products. That's for one thing. Now, being a pan-European system, 
uh, uh, like in meteorology, if you have a global weather forecast, um, it, it is clear that due to the spatial and temporal resolution um, of, uh, of, of such a continental scale system, there is limits when it comes to um, to very high resolution uh, national or regional systems. And these limits um, are, are are discussed and are usually clearly we have a we have for example a verification skill score of our system which is available to all um, to all the partners as well. So I mean there is always going to be a discrepancy between uh, um, between the national uh, let's say models which are much higher resolution uh, and, a, and a continental scale system. As I said, I mean, we are focusing on very large scale, um, let's say medium range forecasts that we try to provide to the national services which often do not have those kinds of information. I'm not sure if, I, if this is uh, the answer to your question. Regarding the South. Yes. So there is not any agreement or bilateral convention for the taking a provisional.